Good morning everybody, welcome to the course of smart materials and intelligent system design. In this particular module, we are learning how to model the induced strain actuation mechanisms. So, towards that direction, I have already told you about the uniform strain model of induced strain actuation, which I am going to apply today for a different material. And also, we have talked about the piezoelectric actuators in that context and various displacement and force measurement techniques in piezoelectric actuators. So, today our focus will be another smart material which is magnetostrictive material. So, we will see that how we can generate induced strain actuation from magnetostrictive material and how that affects when I surface bond or embed a magnetostrictive material inside a host structure like a host beam. Now, so I will be talking about induced strain actuation. So, that is ISA is induced strain actuation short form induced strain actuation. In short, I will call it as ISA and we will also talk about the blocking force that MMA again this is another acronym I have used. So, MMA is magnetostrictive mini actuator, magnetostrictive mini actuator. So, we will see that how the blocking force is generated in MMA and also we will see that when we will be running this particular system, uh, how you know because the magnetic field is generated by the application of current how the temperature gets generated as a side effect which is not desirable and how that affects the entire constitutive relationship. So, this is something additional in comparison to the piezoelectric material, this is an adverse effect which we have to take into account. Also, we will be talking about uh, two additional things which actually behave in a similar manner. So, I have grouped them together, these are both AFC is our active fiber composite, these are piezoelectric both piezoelectric in nature active fiber composite. We have to keep these acronyms in our mind, because that is the way they are popular in the market and MFC is macro fiber composite. Okay. So, these are the things that we would like to cover in today's lecture. Let us then begin with the ISA of MMA. Now, before we start the ISA modeling for magnetostrictive actuation, a little bit of generic thing is that the terphenol D is generally used for this magnetostrictive actuation. I have already talked about terphenol D to you that what it is, it contains of terbium, iron and dysprosium. And the governing equation which we will be describing the constraint strain is similar to piezoelectric to piezo system except that you have to consider the temperature effect also. So, we will talk about it and unlike the piezo actuators what is dissimilar also is that the effect of thickness of a magnetostrictive mini actuator that is not negligible. So, in the uniform strain model we cannot neglect that. Now, typically how does a magnetostrictive mini actuator look like as you can see that this is what is the you know this is the way you can purchase it and essentially each one of them will be having as an output point here. So, this is the point where it is going to apply the force or displacement on the system. Now, there are systems in which instead of a single rod like as we can see in this case it will be something like where you have two terphenol D's. So, you can see here that this is a uh, rather more you know uh, involved uh, more intricate design of an MMA. So, you can see that there are terphenol D rods here. So, these are I am just you know for your 
understanding, I am just hashing it. So, there are two terpenol D rods here as you can see. Okay. So, this is one model. Some models use one terpenol D rod, some use two. Naturally, if we use two, it will be small but compact and it will give you more force. Now, these terpenol D rods are first biased by these you know field. So, you are going to have both permanent magnet as well as electromagnet in the whole system. So, as you can see here that number 2 is here the magnetic coils. So, number 2 this is the magnetic coil that is surrounding this system. Okay. You what this we expect is that as we apply you know the current here, okay, we expect that these terpenol D rods are going to expand. Okay. Now, as they are expanding, so as you can see from this particular construction that they can only you know push the whole system towards this direction. So, this way it can come out. So, that is your output direction. Okay. So, these two forces are basically going to push this system in the upward direction and this whole system is fitted with a believable spring in order to give us more or less a linear actuation system. So, that is the point we have to keep in our mind when we will be designing or modeling uh, magnetostrictive actuation. Now, uh, how do we uh, model the induced strain actuation? Let us try to work it out. We have done it earlier also. So, let us consider that we have a, a beam system like this. Okay. So, we have a beam. On that beam, I have fixed this magnetostrictive mini actuator. For the time being, let us also neglect the shear lag effect. This you know anyway, once you know the basic relationships, how to add the shear lag effect. Okay. Now, I told you that the magnetostrictive actuators give us output from one direction. Let us say that this is what is the direction and in this case is the reverse way. So, I am going to get force in this way here and this way here. Okay, which means I am basically producing moment, external moment in the system. Now, let us say that this particular beam is of thickness T and these magnetostrictive mini actuators, each one of them are identical and they are of thickness T m. Okay, so, this is what we will need and this is the force that is getting generated by the magnetostrictive mini actuator that force equal and opposite force is going to create a moment in the system. So, if I look at the moment diagram, then we need to first see that the bending moment will create a bending stress in the system, which will be basically opposing this you know direction of the forces. So, essentially we expect that we will be having stresses here like this in the material linearly varying the stresses and here in this direction we are going to have stresses in the opposite direction in the system. Right? So, we are going to have stresses which will be like this. So, at this point we have the maximum stress right sigma m. And what will be the stresses inside the magnetostrictive material? Well, this will be uniform in nature, in here also it will be uniform in nature. So, these are uniform stresses, that is what is our uniform stress model. Okay. So, the strain here basically is the same, let us call that as epsilon m, and here also the corresponding strain is epsilon m, that is the maximum strain that is getting generated in the system. Now, if I try to do a force balance in the system, so what is the internal uh, moment resistance that is happening in the system? Well, uh, we can use the bending relationship, simple you know bending relationships which tells us that m by i for the beam equals to sigma m which is the maximum stress divided by T by 2. This is occurring at this particular point, so it is T by 2. So, in other words our bending moment that will be generated is actually sigma m 
i and 2 times this divided by t. So, this since we know now we can also write this as 2 what is the maximum stress that is getting generated that is E times epsilon m i over t. So, that is the bending resistance okay, moment. So, that if I put as one of the resisting moment i by t plus we add with this the resisting moment that will be there in this magnetostrictive mini actuators itself. So, for that it is simple that the stress here is uniform. So, life is simpler for us. So, that means that force that it will be generating will be something like sigma m which we can write it as magnetostrictive actuators uh, say modulus of elasticity equivalent modulus of elasticity. E m epsilon m that times let us consider that a m is the equivalent area considering all the rods that we will be having. So, this is the force and then what is the moment arm for this? This here it is not negligible this distance which we have neglected for the other case. So, this moment arm will be T plus T m. So, it will be T plus T m and that equals to the other side also if we consider that the force is generated by the free strain lambda then we can also write this as lambda E m A m T plus T m. Okay. So, that is what is the moment external moment. So, I have balanced the internal and the external moment. Now, is a little bit of algebra if I do. So, it will be 2 uh, let us take the epsilon m uh, the maximum strain uh, you know that we are trying to find out let us take it in the outside. So, it will be 2 e by 12 b t cube times t plus e m a m t plus t m which equals to lambda e m a m t plus t m right. So, I can actually write this as epsilon m and this t is cancelling t square. So, I can write this as epsilon n 2 e b t square plus 12 e m a m t plus t m that must be equal to lambda 12 e m a m t plus t m on the other side. right? So, essentially what is the constraint strain? or the induced strain, this is the induced strain, right. This is the final induced strain, even though you are applying lambda as the free strain, because you are constraining it the actual induced strain okay, at that point of transfer that equals to what lambda times a factor and that factor is 12 e m a m t plus t m divided by 2 e b t square plus 12 e m a m t plus t m. This can be you know we can just simply organize it in a manner that this becomes 1 over okay, 1 plus 2 e b t square divided by 12 e m a m t plus t m. Okay. So, this is how we can derive that what will be the actual induced strain in the system for magnetostrictive actuation and you see the difference is that we have to consider this T plus T m in this particular case. So, that is what is the expression here for the constraining strain or the induced strain that is happening in the system. Now, 
uh, what is the lambda next? Next question will be where am I going to use the constitutive relationship in the system. Now, lambda as you know that it is the free strain in the system. So, what was the strain expression? If you just try to recall it was S sigma plus D uh, of the magnetostricty material times H. Now, lambda is the active free strain which comes from this point. Okay. So, this is lambda. So, lambda is actually supposed to be d m h. Now, because we are working with magnetostricty material this m I will not write many a times. So, this is basically d and h we will write it and what is h? If there are number of turns n and if there is l as the length of the coil. So, that will give us that uh, you know that times i that will give us the uh, what you call a free strain in the system. And this whole parameters you can write it as d g i t okay, that is the parametric constant g. Now, in addition to that you see I have added some more parameter here. Okay. Now, what is this? This is because of the thermal uh, this is because of the thermal effect. Okay. So, how does this thermal effect comes into picture? Let us just spend one or two more minutes on that. Okay. So, before we do that another thing is that what is the blocking force in the system? Well, the blocking force in the system is 2 times a m times sigma. Okay. If suppose both of them uh, you know work in the same direction and uh, it uh, and if it opposes then you know the negative signs will come up and that blocking force you can see will be having two parts in it. One is because of this active part okay, and this should be clear to you that in the last expression if you remember that we have uh, you know uh, denoted this part as the lambda part. Uh, okay. So, that is what is coming up here. The only thing is that 1 by s is actually nothing but E m. Okay. So, that if you keep in mind you will get this expression which is simply that the blocking force is estimated by putting both the uh, you know magnetostrictive effect as well as the thermal effect. So, this is due to magnetostriction and this is also as a adverse byproduct of the whole thing which is due to the thermal effect. As I will be applying current in the coil to magnetize this current will have a heat which will be generated and that will create this part in it. How to integrate this temperature effect? Oh, we have come across this let us think of it. First of all you have to keep this uh, thing in mind that you have these two basic relationships with you. As I have told you earlier epsilon is S sigma plus d h and B is the you know magnetic flux intensity that is d sigma plus mu h. Now, as I am applying current in the coil what is happening? It is generating the magnetic field all around okay. and that magnetic field is part of it is coming back to the terpenol d rod suppose if it is a terpenol d rod. And what we try to do is that we try to stop these entries by giving a return path here. So, if we keep you know two iron uh, or ferromagnetic blocks there you can give a return path. So, that most of the magnetic field remains contained in the system. Now, with this model if you look at it that uh, the first point is that how the heat is getting generated in the system. Okay. That is happening because I have a coil if you imagine that this is the coil part of it and the coil has uh, is passing a current I. So, because of which there is a I square R effect that is coming into the picture uh, multiplied by a suitable material constant. What is the uh, uh, heat flow that is in the uh, magnetostrictive material? Because this is our magnetostrictive material right, this is our terpenol D rod let us say. So, that Q m in the uh, you know when T equals to 0 at the very beginning. Okay. There is an uh, you know ambience it is same as the ambient uh, temperature. So, at that point of time if the effective thermal resistance uh, you know consider both conduction and convection because as you can see that these are the terms related to uh, you know conduction and this is related to convection. So, 
you can get the expression of q m by simple heat equation that that is what is the heat flow uh, rate at the uh, you know when t is 0. And now, this is the initial condition and this is what happens at the steady state. So, if I uh, you know solve this I am going to get q m at any point of time as an exponential function uh, which is again you know governed by a parameter c 2. Okay. So, I am going to get this q m t as a function of uh, you know q s t uh, multiplied by a exponential envelope. Now, if you also look at the energy balance, so the energy balance of the steady state which is q m and that equals to you can actually get it from the change of temperature in the system. So, by applying these equations you should be able to find out that what is the change of temperature that is happening in the system. Because now you know this d t at e between uh, say t equals to 0 to t equals to some finite time you can actually integrate and you will get this delta t and then that will give you this you know integration effect that is coming into the picture. So, essentially what is happening as we are passing the current okay, initially the ambient temperature and the temperature the terminal d rod are same. The moment I start to pass the current the coil is getting heated up and a part of it based on the effective resistance thermal resistance a part of it is going inside the terminal d rod and that uh, you know is uh, actually heating up until and unless you reach a stage when it reaches a steady state with the ambient system and that is the part that we are deriving through this particular expression. And so, this we can now integrate in our effect the only thing now is that you earlier remember the expression of blocking force. Now, the uh, magnetic point of view the uh, from the Maxwell's equation the magnetomotive force can be written in terms of magnetic flux and in terms of the reluctances of the system. Okay. So, what are the sources of reluctances for us? We have this magnetostick T material, okay. if there are two of them so it is going to give 2 times R m and then we have uh, these uh, you know uh, the end plates there okay, in both the sides. So, I am getting the effect of each one of them. So, thus we are getting all this and the magnetic flux phi is passing through the whole system. So, through a simplified magnetic circuit model which is very much similar like our electrical resistance model uh, the electromotive force emf there that is replaced by the magnetomotive force. So, you should be able to calculate the two you know the in this case what is the force that is happening in the system. Now, if you consider this equation itself then the f uh, is can be replaced by this n which is the number of turns in each coil times i t and uh, this actually is divided by the length of the uh, coil and that uh, you can take into account here. So, that is uh, for the magnetostick T material and these two are for the end plates uh, that you have rear and the front plate uh, you know system. So, uh, also we have to keep in mind that the total magnetic flux is continuous right. It is the same phi we have assumed is uh, going through the system there is no leakage in this system. So, you can get this relationship because the total magnetic flux is the same. So, that will essentially give us a relationship between what is H e 1 in terms of H t and what is H e 2 in terms of H t provided you know the magnetic field permeabilities etcetera and the area of cross section of both the systems. So, then I can use all these equations now together okay, and I can get the relationship earlier I got a relationship uh, in terms of strain. Now, I can get a relationship in terms of the actual displacement that is going to happen in a magnetostick team material okay, which is first of all a function of a stress that it is subjected to and then this is the free strain part. So, this is the mechanical part due to mechanical displacement okay, mechanical uh, stress and then this is due to active 
uh, stress and this is due to thermal strain okay, that it is going to affect the system. So, uh, what is the G here that is a little bit complicated as you can see here that G is actually N over this particular thing which takes into account all the important factors like the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, and the length of the magnetostatic T material, the length of the end effector all these things together we get this particular expression in the system. So, we have seen that how we can actually model a magnetostatic T mini actuator. Similar things can be done on active fiber composite and MFCs, but these are uh, consisting of piezo ceramic fibers. Now, these AFC fibers are developed using standard sol gel technique, whereas MFC fibers are essentially chopped form of the PZT blocks. So, MFC fibers are uh, rectangular in cross section and that offers you know better uh, contact between the fibers. Okay. So, that way MFCs are little better in comparison to the AFCs, because AFCs are developed using standard sol gel technique. So, they are basically round in terms of their shape and so a round shape you know would not give you a good contact area. On the other hand, if you get a rectangular block, then you are going to get a good contact area in the system. So, that is the, so this is what is our uh, MFC and this is what is our AFC that is the difference in terms of the geometry in the system. Now, however, from the principle in which it works it is somewhat similar. So, here what we have tried to show you is that uh, in the figure A you know you have a linear model for the AFC actuated beam okay, and uh, you, we have just uh, you know just compared similar to the one for the PZT actuated beam. Okay. So, uh, you can see that you know you can actually consider the variation in the system. So, you can of course, apply the Euler Bernoulli uh, model in this particular case and the beam is of thickness 2 H and these parts are of thickness H A. So, with that once again if you carry out a very similar moment balance you will see that the actual strain that it will be giving is K F lambda Z and k f is given by this particular expression and lambda that is the most important thing the free strain is actually d 3 3 v over h a. Now, you consider all the advantages are actually here because of this lambda why first of all d 3 3 is much much greater than d 3 1 I told you. So, you are going to get more strain. Secondly, if you think of the intensity that is important then by using the same voltage because H A, H A is much much smaller than the you know uh, traditional piezo ceramic uh, plates etcetera. So, H piezo. So, you are going to get a much higher uh, you know electric field intensity. So, this will be increasing and this will be increasing as a result you will get a very high lambda and as you are getting a very high lambda you will be able to generate more strain through this MFCs and AFCs. I will show you in the laboratory you know how you can use them for vibration control. So, this is where we will come to an end in the next lecture we will learn about modeling of shape memory alloys. Thank you.